All right, um, we're about to get started. I just want to let everyone know that this is being recorded. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there's forewarning. It's going to be shared on Tribe's Facebook page and social media after the fact so that more people will get a chance to watch it if you um, didn't come here today. Um, yeah, so this is Tribes Spotlight Series. If you don't know, A Gathering of the Tribes is a nonprofit art and literary organization that was founded by Steve Cannon in the early 90s. Um, Tribes began as a multicultural arts organization and one-of-a-kind artist salon. And now we are committed to serving revolutionary artists and writers of diversity. We have a Black Lives Matter issue coming out. Um, we do a biennial print journal, and that's going to be coming out edited by Ishmael Reed, um, co-edited by Margaret Porter Troop and the, with our editor, Danny Simmons. And that'll be coming out at the end of this year or possibly the beginning of next year. But it is in the works, and we're very excited. We also just started our new fiscal sponsorship program. And we already have one fiscal sponsored organization called the Toppled Monuments Archive. And they are creating a comprehensive internet archive of all of the monuments that have been toppled around the world throughout history. It's a very cool project. You can check it out at tribes.org. And if you have a project that you would like a fiscal sponsorship for, because maybe you're not incorporated and you need some funding, you can also apply for fiscal sponsorship at tribes.org. I'm very happy to have everyone here today. We always begin with a toast to our founder, the great blind professor, novelist, playwright, and professional heckler, Steve Cannon. And for this toast, everybody get whatever your libations are. Maybe it's juice, maybe it's alcohol. I don't know. I don't judge. Get whatever they are and drink to Steve wherever he is. I'm going to read a little excerpt of a piece of Steve's to kick this off, it's called Going Blind. Um, and as many of you know, Steve Cannon was completely blind by the time he started Tribes. He went blind and decided to open an art gallery because that's just, um, that's the kind of guy he was. So this is Steve Cannon's own writing in his words about beginning to go blind. It was back in 1981 after returning from a trip to Nicaragua that I realized I was losing my eyesight. What a frightening experience to be in an airport surrounded by strangers as my eyesight start, started failing. In the black archetypical universe, our blind artists are almost always musicians from blind Lemon Jefferson to Ray Charles to Stevie Wonder. But I'm a writer and face a different dilemma. Unlike musicians who rely on good ears to hear and memorize tunes, as a writer, I rely on information that is 90% dependent on eyesight. With the no more than 98% of my eyesight gone, it takes me forever to read students' papers and newspapers, a book of poetry or a novel, but it makes me a better listener and forces me to live more within the world, the world of my own imagination, to guard against my fears. I am come to depend on the kindness of others. I took a disability leave from college and one of the things I've done during my leave, during my leave time that I'm quite proud of is to start a multicultural organization called A Gathering of the Tribes, which publishes a literary magazine. The magazine is put out twice a year by the same group of friends and artists who have been so helpful in my personal life. These people, my tribe, who accompany me, company to mostly familiar places. As far as my own writing is concerned, I dictate material to one of my friends who then reads it aloud for me to edit. In spite of my impending blindness in many ways, I find life more beautiful than ever because of the love I give and receive from others. I am able to keep on keeping on. Steve Cannon. Everybody, little cheers to Steve. You're here, Steve. Here, here. <laughs> All right, thank you for joining us. We're um, going to let the writers begin now. And he does need a little introduction. Um, Benga Adishino is the winner of the 2020 Narrative Prize. 
He is a Nigerian writer and the author of the chat book, Painter of Water, a meditation on intimacy in the face of historical violence, published in the New Generation African Poets series by the University of Nebraska and Akashic Books. He has received fellowships and scholarships from the Fine Arts Center, Poets House, New York University, where he received his MFA and Colgate University. His work has been published in the New York Times, the Prairie Schooner, Washington Square Review, and elsewhere. Everybody, please welcome Benga. Alrighty, hello. Um, how's everyone doing uh, this evening? It's a joy to be here with um, Wanda, Eva, and T.A. Conrad, who all are marvelous poets. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm gonna read a few poems. I think I have about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so I'm gonna read a few poems. I think most of those poems are going to be about my father. Um, but, but the major themes are gonna be around alienation, immigration, the border, death, mortality, melancholy, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, mm -hmm. A few years ago, when I was, when I was getting my MFA, um, I would go to my teacher and said, you know, I'm trying to write a lot of poems. I'm trying to write all kinds of poems, but they end up being about my father. You know, you start a first line and then the poem ends up being about the father in some ways. And then she pulled a book from a, from a shelf um, titled Father, 50 Poems About a Father, you know. Um, so that has inspired me to stay in the grief, to not be uncomfortable with grief in a culture that's usually uncomfortable with grief. Um, so that's, that's what I'm gonna do this evening, okay? Uh, again, thank you for coming. You could be doing all kinds of wonderful things on a beautiful evening like this, so thank you. Alrighty, so here's a first poem titled Glory, Glory. Let's look for the poem. All right, glory. Glory of plants, female of glory. Glory of ferns on a dark platter. Glory of willows. Glory of stag beetles. Glory of the long obedience of the king fisher. Glory of water birds. Glory of thirst. Glory of the Latin of the dead and their grammar composed entirely of decay. Glory of the eyes of my father, which when he died closed inside his grave and opened even more brightly inside me. Glory of dark horses running furiously inside their own dark horses. Alrighty, another poem I'm going to read is tied to surrender. Surrender. A mercy puts a thing on my palm, and it's my childhood. It's tiny, endless mott city. It's rhymed like grace or tenderness or sorrow. In the red brick room, my father cries. His cries are small, lonely animals. I carry them with me like an inheritance. Once I ran out of a room because the song on the radio was a feast in the nook of my neck. I stood on the street quietly weeping, though when a woman said to me, child, are you well? I said, it was the waters within me that wanted to make themselves known. Some nights are like that. They do not let you go until they are broken into the secret July in your heart where you hide all things. All I wanted was to be home, so I dipped myself under the earth, by which I mean I entered the subway station. It was there I heard him, 
a man that was also a sound. He was singing, tree branches broke inside his voice. There was in his chorus, the quietude of a thing that was coming to an end. The song he was singing, he said it was not a dirge, though he sang it to a thing that was dying. Wishing away was the kind of song my father sang as he lay dying. My father said his song was not a dirge, though he sang it to a thing that was dying in himself. He said, son, my song is a joy, but a joy with sharp knives. So my laughter is a thing with a sharp edge, and my joy a trembling. Thus man I saw his locks of hair, which ran down to his neck, with the visible borders of a country that was inside him, and the sound he made was the secret language of a nation unto which immigrants were called. It was, it was as though I had sliced through the ocean and arrived here only to run into my childhood. And I did not want to make myself open, but I was made open for certain songs do not ask for permission. I raised my hands and moved toward him naked before the song. I said, dear music, dear childhood, take me, take me. All righty, righty, we're still doing father poems. Um, let's see. So this is called, I carry my father across the sea. I carried my father across the sea. So I actually forgot to track my time. How am I doing? I just got lost in the poems. You're doing just fine. You've done about, I think okay, like five minutes. You. You've got more time. Please take it. Okay, good, awesome. Thank you. This is God, I carried my father across the sea. He was a child. He was dead. He was the shaft of a long-tailed astrapia. He was a forest of Bruce. He wore a door on his face. He wore the black suit of his wedding. The square pocket was still full of his vows. He was light to carry. His burdens and vows had bled out of him. He was heavy with the responsibility of the dead. What sort of a son leaves his father chained to fatherhood? I lifted and propped him up with my frame. I measured the length of him with my length. The feet stuck in sea sand, his weak knees, his arms gripped my sides. As the currents rose, the collar on his broken neck flared into a float. The gash, the surgeon's knife left on his head became a hollow. It signaled in the dark. I put my nose to his nose. I put my finger in his mouth. I tied his ivy tubes, now a human gill, around our waist and swam in the vein of the water. Look, as things in the wave said, a son carries a father. Death is not silence, it is where I hear you most clearly. What sort of a son leaves his father's body chained to the dark grievance inside the earth? I carried my father on my back. I felt the brazen inside his afterlife heart on the skin of my spine. He wore his face as a door he promised to open to me. He bled out his vows. Alrighty, this next poem is called Vows, you know, just because that one handed me vows. I tell it's a good segue, vows. When my father fell into himself, and the waters within him broke their vows, she wilted to half of her cup. She wrapped herself in a black shawl. She, my mother, crawled to his side, put her hair to his chest, said, if a body is yours, you can hear where silence trots in its skin. She, my mother, put her mouth to my father's hair, said, I'll call your body, which is mine by name, and you will come back to me. How can a body, the whole length of which you once traveled with your tongue, close itself to you? When he, my father, closed his eyes and breath and his body became a bridge he had left behind on a journey and they wheeled him down the stairs, she sprang after them. She cried out, my name is inside his tongue. I need to get it back. All right, and let me see if I can do one or two more poems. We'll be good. This is called Ode to What I Do Not Know. 
ode to what I do not know. Ode to what I do not know. To animals, doe-eyed, sleek, across the road into the fermor of the night. Their feet learn the reptile skin of earth, dark roots, and the tetrin of dream. I wake up away from myself. The fast animals of my eyes crouch through tickets into a sky-colored beach where I suddenly look up and see that my tongue is a country of birds. This water twists like a snake to taste itself. What is this you know? I have never tasted of myself. I do not know myself. On a morning radio show about color, a man phoned in. There was a child howling in the house of his mouth. He said, please listen to me. Please, I'm prejudiced. His voice cracked. I need help. What spilled out of the stereo lay on my floor, breathing. It had force, dark, Lord, the fees of it. Some night I wake up panting, knowing that I'm a stranger with accent, homeless in the childhood country of my body. Some night I clench my fist, my teeth. I try hard to not turn on my bed. I fear what leaves in me might spill out and darken the floor. A knife, not silence, sliced through us. What is loss if not your body refusing to give you back to yourself? One more thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you for bringing your kids. I love it when kids listen to poems. One more poem. Tate ways of naming my father's body. My father's body knew pleasure. It tasted like turn on his flesh. Once on a bus, a child smarted me and I knew it was my father's body. On some days, the morning is my father's body. I wear it like loneliness. When I'm dancing and twisting alone in the dark, my father's body joins me. It brings in night as his dance partner. Once on a street in New York, afraid for my life, I shouted at my father to stay back indoors. I told him to not come out of my body. I am the light of the world. My father's body is the world. Sometimes when I'm singing, a door opens and gives my father's body back to the night he was born. Felakuti dancing on the stage is my father's body. I sat beside a man a while ago at a garden. His arm was my father's body. I love the magpie. It has my father's body. The man sitting beside you is my father's body. He's dead. His body is a sigh. Where I come from, rain lives on the father's body. Once at a rock concert, I asked for a daddy martini. My hand wanted to find a way to hold the night. The paw of the electric gator was my father's body. In the beginning, God made heaven and earth and my father's body. Thank you so much for listening. I'm grateful. Thank you so much, Benga. Oh my God. I'm um, also a poet and a writer and sometimes that is contradictory to being a host, um, especially when I hear poetry that moving, there's not a whole lot else that I have to say except everything you just said. Um, I guess I know a lot of people have experienced a lot of grief lately, um, especially over the last year. I personally have lost about seven people in less than two years. So I'm sitting with that grief a lot and just hearing your words and you really like taking space to dig deep into that feeling. Um, very moving and I appreciate you taking time to sit with that and to study that. And I hope that you will look at the comments and see um, some of the reactions that people gave you because I know it can feel like you're speaking into a void but I think the audience was very present for you. Thank you so much. Everybody, um, find a way to give a virtual applause again to Banga, please. Thank you so much. That was gorgeous. All right. Um, I'm just, I feel so lucky that I've been able to curate this reading. Um, these are four of my favorite living poets who are here right now. <laughs> I really do love all of this work and have devoured um, a lot of these poets' work over the years. Um, and this poet, um, 
C.A. Conrad has been working with the ancient technologies of poetry and ritual since 1975. They are the author of Amanda Paradise from Wave Books in 2021, just out. Other titles include The Book of Frank, While Standing in Line for Death, and Eco Deviance. They received a Creative Capital Grant, a Pew Fellowship, a Lambda Literary Award, and a Believer Magazine Book Award. They teach at Columbia University in New York City and Sandberg Art Institute in Amsterdam. Everybody, please give a virtual round of applause to C.A. Conrad. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you so much for having me and publishing me. That reading was amazing. Beautiful. Oh, did somebody ask something? Oh. I hear something. I heard someone, yeah, the audience should probably mute themselves during your reading if they're not. Oh, I thought somebody was asking me something. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm just gonna read my poems. I'm gonna share the screen. I'm gonna start off with two poems from my book that's just about to come out. It's called Amanda Paradise. <clears throat> Golden in the morning, crane our necks. In a past life, I was a little fish who cleaned the shells of turtles. A dream helped me remember their deep voice of thanks. Many nights I heard sharks waiting for the tide to draw me near. When the calendar runs out, it feels lucky another awaits. All I have ever wanted was to forge the English language into a spear and drive it into my heart. Between leaping and being shoved, the lonelier place to put my faith for the swinging motion inside the dance we share. Don the extraordinary suit for this ordinary day. Take our time studying trees to imagine the nests we would build if we were birds. I ask all you talented people spending many creative hours perfecting killer drones, guns, and bombs to please know we are waiting for you on the other side of art in the no kill zone. I don't know, it's, people think this is uh, supposed to be the state of Texas. I mean, I get it, I get it, but I didn't, um, that wasn't the original intent. <laughs> On all fours, I'm a seat for the wind. Most of my family's international travel is being sent to war. If we judge love, we can kill off anything dragged by our hair across the days until they make their way inside our dreams where we get to evict them. I want to thank the one who invented knocking on the door, but no one remembers their name to tattoo across my knuckles. I asked an archeologist about first time she stuck a shovel in the ground. Her answer had same restorative powers as the grave diggers. When we die, we can no longer wipe the muck off. Just lie there becoming shit of the world. Eat a chip of your own dry blood. Join me in the cannibal sunshine, fully persuaded by the world through song. Each morning, a blue jay screams at edge of the clear cut forest. I scream with her at the bleeding stumps. Scream inside something borrowed like ocean, like skin. I want to see before I die, a mink wearing a human scarf, skin from a handsome hairy leg, meow. I don't think minks meow, but mine does in my poem at least. So here's two more poems, wait a second, did I, um, can you see that? Just two more poems from, oh, is it, or is it one? It's uh, one more poem from Amanda Paradise. M drew his, I, the thing is about this pandemic, uh, I, when I was a teenager in the 1980s and, and I lost many friends to AIDS in the 80s and 90s, so many people and it's been 
coming up in my, you know, my, my life again, thinking about these people with COVID. M drew his face the day he was diagnosed HIV positive and kept drawing as his face changed. They were sublime, like Monk's self-portrait with Spanish flu. He called on his deathbed at his parents' home to say his father was in the backyard burning the stack of drawings. I wanted to make him stop. Please don't, he said. It's his last chance to deny me. How can I deny him that? And um, I just want to put this over there for anybody who's interested in the chat. I'm going to share the screen to finish. I'm going to read um, a few new poems, including the one that I'm very excited is published along everybody's aside, everybody else here for and tribes. So the poems that I just finished reading are from a completely different ritual I was working on with extinct animals, but this new one is uh, interspecies cooperation and communication. And um, yeah, so I'll just read these three little poems. And thank you again for having me. Losing something too important to lose is hard the first time. So next time, ransom April's song before it finds itself. I took my time finding the right man to build this wall against the phantasm. We're rowing to the middle of the Bermuda Triangle. We send our love. The wishing we did at the shopping mall fountain leveled the place with its own lingering hope answering the call to arms with a toy piano. If our cells have always been here, what about the rage? What about depression marked with a story? Somewhere in the world, the Jeep that killed O'Hara hurts every time you start it. And I'm gonna end with this poem that I'm very excited is published in Tribes. Thank you for publishing this poem. What was the point of today? Nothing more than microscopic creatures on my eyelids reaching for sunlight with me. How hard is your historical memory? As in gay bashing 101, same day you learn hieroglyph means sacred carving. Elegy is not a form, it's a state of being the poet must write from. A faggot takes a beating from another holy book. And the band said, this is my four leaf clover. What did they say? This is my four leaf clover. Thank you. Thank you so much, CA. <laughs> Thank you. I love that. Um, the Jeep hurts every time. Wow. I hope that you also look in the comments to see the audience's reaction since everyone was so silent. Um, <laughs> that was truly amazing. I did not expect the shapes to be so compelling. When you first asked to share the screen, I thought I'd rather see your face, but I wouldn't rather see your face. I like seeing the shapes of the poems. <laughs> no, no, nothing against your face. It was actually really nice to see the poems. They're like little masterpieces. I want to frame and put on the wall now. That was beautiful. Everybody, please give some sort of virtual round of applause. You can make some noise right now if you want or put in the comments um, your applause for CA Conrad. Thank you so much for sharing. I am absolutely loving this. These are, <laughs> someone in the comments said, don't mess with Texas shaped poems. Ugh. It did look a lot like Texas. So uh, just saying, it did. Um, I am absolutely loving this. And, you know, I think if you love poetry, you gotta love this reading. It's really good poetry. Not everybody takes time for poetry anymore, but they should, because it's fucking gorgeous. Um, I am very excited for this ne next reader. I think she knows who she is and she's on deck. Wanda Phipps is a writer, translator, editor, living in New York City. What, New York City? 
Her books include Field of Wanting, Poems of Desire, and Wake Up Calls, 66 Morning Poems. Her poetry has been translated into Ukrainian, Hungarian, Arabic, Galatian, and Bangla. She received awards from the New York Foundation for the Arts, the National Theater Translation Fund, and others. As a founding member of Yara Arts Group, she has collaborated on numerous theatrical productions presented in Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, Siberia, and at La Mama in NYC. She curated reading series at the Poetry Project at St. Mark's Church and has written about the arts for Time Out New York and Paper Magazine. Her new book, Mind Honey, is forthcoming from Autonomy Media Press. Everybody give a virtual round of applause to Wanda Phipps. Here she comes. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone involved in putting this series together. I have um, kind of a solid 12 minutes. So I'm just going to jump right in. And my first poem is called Natural Disaster. Not a raging fire, but a hurricane runs through my body, a rushing, swirling mass of energy, tying knots in my neck, shoulders, tingling in my legs and feet. A tension like a motor in my back. I try to throw a wrench in it disable it, tame it, subvert or dislodge or dissipate it, to break the machine of memory, thoughts backbending in my brain. Still the broken pieces fall, but never reach the ground. And this next one is called In the Garden. A sentence, a line, a sentiment work through haze, walk through fog, a face of the all, a face for all, standing and stillness. Where in my body is this? Where does the light work? Now, not then, how, not when, a blue November, amber December, feel around the story, sonic flash, fighting for peace like screaming for quiet. Bend to the hollow heart, bow to the heart in flames, an evocative tease, a space for imagination, December roses, gulls on the water, thumb on the baseline, lilac on my tongue, wires in my teeth, garden of gods. And now I like to read uh, a couple of poems from my pandemic diary series. And this one was from the very beginning before the shutdown um, last year, Monday, March 16th, 2020. Is a poet's life less important than an engineer's? My stomach is churning with anger or fear, perhaps both. Am I safe? Is my family safe? Are my friends safe? Is anyone ever safe? My throat tickles, itches, pain gone, burning gone, but my chest feels heavy. People on the subway this morning with scarves around their mouths and noses, not from the cold, but fear of contagion, infection, the virus. Someone texted me calling it CV. And I first thought they meant an academic resume, CV, curriculum vitae, but no, they meant the coronavirus or COVID-19. And this is from a little later, Tuesday, March 24th, 2020. We are all on lockdown now working from home or out of a job. Today, I left the house for the first time in three days for a short walk on my my work from home lunch break, a walk along the narrows, watching seagulls on the water, watching them sit and settle and float on top of the water, legs busy paddling below, watching them float then fly off. While I wondered, when will things get back to normal? And what is normal anyway? Back to my apartment, which is now my office, Rebel without a cause on the TV in the background, juggling emails, work calls, and all kinds of numbers in the foreground. Now, a new kind of normal. 
And this next one is not from the pandemic series. It's written after the style of my friend, the wonderful playwright and poet, Dennis Moritz. And it's called Picture. My eyes close on my most favorite image after I vowed to let it go, but it stays plugged in an after image seared to the inside of my lid by the sun. Not exactly accurate, but close enough. It all seems close enough to touch the ginger beard, the coral bead, the loose notes floating in air, the hand and soul attached could be egg-shaped, could be rectangular or a spiral forever curling inward or outward. Time to change trains, get on the right track, back to the familiar, back to the geometric outline, the grid pressed onto the lid embedded in the soul's eye. And this is uh, from another short series called Write Three Poems and Call Me in the Morning. This is number three. Will you dance with me on the edge of time? Is that a song? It should be. You say, I think too much. I analyze stuff to within an inch of its life. But I would love to get that close to see that close to an inch of any life but the walls are so various and so strongly built. I'm always miles away observing from my magnifying telescope, the microscopic shifts in your smile. And this is number four in the series, but it was um, actually inspired by the Ukrainian poet I translate with Verlana Koch, Serhi Jadon, in his poem, Psalm to Av Aviation, number seven. Will you write about this? Even though you are happy and you say you only write when you're sad, will you write about this into a night when sleep escapes? like a lonely whistling wind when no one can see you or hear you. And there is a stillness deeper than deep, softer than soft, opening and closing like breath, a long, slow breath that releases everything into everything. Will I be there in your head, in your heart? Will anyone? Will the collective consciousness of all that has been and ever will be whisper to you? Will you feel it like a heart beating, pounding, a rhythm over and over again through the ages? Will you write about this? Will you write it well? Will I read it? And this is number five in the series, and it's inspired by Jadon's Psalm to Aviation number nine. And it's about a recent uh, trip I took to the Frick Modern Museum. Rembrandt's eyes followed her from every edge of the room. Rembrandt's eyes watched her, spoke to her in a language she had forgotten. Her eyes were rimmed with coal asking history to speak to her beyond the astronomical clocks, beyond the bronzed statues of Hercules, beyond the progress of love that flooded off the edges of the Fragonards through the shadowy rooms of Vermeer. Later, they talked around a table with periods of heavy silence held over beer and bourbon exchanging heartbeats. And this is number six in the series, inspired by Jadon's song to aviation, number 10. Number 10. Meeting is being recorded. Ah, okay, a little echo. I have food in the fridge. I have a roof over my head. I have money in my pocket and a brain struggling to focus, to land on a quality of light or shadow, to remember a huge golden supermoon 
the worm moon of the equinox sitting low in the sky, sign of transition, change, the feared unknown, contemplating the hanged muse, the card of contradictions, spring comes in a grand illusion, a promise so sweet I can taste it. And this is not from that series. It's called The Sickness. I think I'm recovering from the infection of you. The thoughts you inserted into my brain with surgical precision. I think I am done and I'm glad. So what is this sick feeling in the pit of my stomach? Why do I have no desire to eat? Maybe hunger has been consumed by your excuses, by the last thought at night, which drifts into a lucid dream of a mouth moving without sound, language evaporating into a dense fog of memory and regret. And this is my last poem that I'll read. And um, I like to say that it's about the first time I went to hear a live music and poetry event um, now that the city is opening up a couple of weeks ago. And it was so much fun. It was uh, John S. Hall performing with his new group called The New Trout and Jane LaCroix singing in her new duo called Shel Shelter Puppy. And there was a woman there writing instant poems for people on an old manual typewriter. And so uh, she chatted with me about my day and wrote a poem about it. And then I went home and I wrote this poem inspired by her poem. And the event, event was at uh, the City Reliquary, which is uh, a tiny museum in Williamsburg of uh, New York City memorabilia. On the City Reliquary. The waters of the narrows widen with the light, sun, moon, following a line of probability, splitting the spinning compass. I turn in the direction of the antidote where the two rivers meet. This rushing fills my ears, focusing a chord of abundance. Every moment now revealing the rocks, the waves, the gulls, the crows, the ducks, the swans, the fish, the tankers, the tugboats, the cruise ships, the sailboats, the ferries, the clouds, the space between the clouds, the bridges, the feet walking step by step, moment by moment on the asphalt, on the grass, on the path of energy moving from emotion to thought to matter to bikes, rolling wheels, air surrounding, permeating all that is and ever will be. The trees standing, branches waving, leaves signaling to jonquils and the bees, the hummingbirds and the daffodils, the new life streaming clearly now and now and now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wanda. Oh my God, thank you for sharing your work. And I hope you will also look at the comments to see how people were reacting during the reading. <laughs> yes. Everyone, please give a big virtual round of applause to Wanda Phipps. Um, all of the poets who you see here today have been published in Tribes Magazine at some point. And I know Wanda has been involved with Tribes for many, many years and friends with Steve for many years. And I just thank you so much for continuing to be part of it. Yeah, okay, she's muted now. Um, so I just want to tell everyone, please check out tribes.org again. Most of the poets you saw here today actually have um, poets published in Tribes Magazine online right now. And you can sit with their work a little longer if you want to by um, taking a look at that. So the next poet and the last poet coming up has a very brief bio, but I'm probably going to like embarrass this poet a little because um, I came across this poet in a way that like I never find a poet. I don't think I've ever come across any other poet this way. 
um, their poetry was featured in a movie. I mean, a movie was sort of like written around her poetry. Um, and I was watching this movie on Netflix called um, I'm Thinking of Ending Things. And at one point, a character in the movie starts reciting um, this poem, like while looking out the window. And I probably rewound the poem and listened to it like four or five times in a row. And I thought, what is this? Um, this is maybe like the best poem, one of the best poems I've ever heard. There's like Ash Wednesday, which I love. And then I was like, and then there's this. And I was like, what, what the hell is this? Um, because it was just, you know, it really blew me away. And I got really sad actually for about an hour because I thought that a screenwriter had written it. And if that were true, for some reason, for me, that would be really horrible <laughs> if a screenwriter wrote like one of the best poems I've ever read. Um, and then I noticed that in the movie, they kept showing this book and this book right here, it's called Rotten Perfect Mouth. And it's a real book and it's written by a real poet who lives in Canada. And I reached out to her and she, amazingly, she joined us today. And she also has some work in um, a Gathering of the Tribes magazine online. So ask and you shall receive, especially if what you're asking for is more poetry is what I've learned. Um, I'm going to read her very, very short bio. Eva HD is the author of Rotten Perfect Mouth, which includes the pieces 38 Michigans and Bone Dog, which is the poem I'm so in love with, featured in the Netflix film I'm Thinking of Ending Things. She works in your favorite bar. Everybody, please welcome and uh, make sure to like really put your listening ears on for Eva HD. Here she comes. Hey, ooh, is it working? I guess so. Ah, um, so I, uh, I'm no I'm normally on Zoom every day, but with uh, six and seven year olds, because um, because you know the world is like very fucked up, and so they need some help. So I'm like, it's exciting. Grown ups, I could say fuck. It's like woo, so festive. Um. Anyway, uh, hey, wow, fuck in the chat, fuck, 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 Whew. so thrilling. Um, yeah, I will now read some things. I'm gonna read uh, this one. I asked a friend today what I should read because I'm uh, indecisive otherwise, and he suggested this one. So it's kind of weird if you don't like it. You can blame my friend and not me. Um, all right, now I will read it. Uh, it's called Postcard from Iceland. The weather is fine. I cannot see for long distances due to hills, but the distances in my head lengthen. I have been thinking about lava how much cooled rock does it take to make a leg to stand on? These are the sorts of thoughts I have here on what you people call vacation. I have been thinking of various wives, of my soul, of my breakfast table, of my dreams. I have been trying to arrange them, these ghosts, in an order that suggests no order, that does not insinuate rank. It has been difficult. I don't believe in ranking things or ghosts or women that I, a man or a ghost of one, have once loved, which is to say continue to, as love does not simply stop at nouns such as wife or 40 or yesterday. I have been thinking of the Irish rain moistening the skin on the scalded milk of my mother's voice, this skin made of milk and rain necessary for the dropping tremolo of a lullaby about a woman who dies alone and unmourned with hands that reek of living fish. I have been thinking that my skin pulls strangely over my bones and that this causes me to make simple spelling errors 
and poor decisions. I have been wondering how deeply into my head my eyes could fall before the bones in my strange, exhausted face would notice, sound the alarm, realign, resurrect. I am no longer confident about the likelihood of remedy. The bones might never notice, I have decided. My dawn starched eyes could fall through endless space forever like unhinged escape pods, celestial garbage. The weather constrains, handcuffs, a throat inflamed. My head is filled with damp strips of cotton that curdle and drip like a fouled poultice. The bombs in the heads of others continue to detonate while mine just seethes and obscures, dripping. There is the reek of kerosene. I ordered a cup of coffee today, then immediately threw it off a cliff right into the North Atlantic without tasting or paying for it. I'm the king of this goddamn island, I screamed foolishly as wolf fish and pollock felt the pH shift in the water and gnashed their snaggled teeth at me. I made myself a cup of coffee today and stood over the kitchen counter and the cup and the floor, barely holding up my feet, which cannot stand my body from which my head hung as it now hangs by one single jealous thread without which I would be undone. I can barely keep my head up. The air is clean and viscous and carbon and I suck it back like is in glass. I can barely lift my head for the air. Oh God, my head. I'm not in Iceland. I hate it here. Um, so that was that was that one. Incidentally, uh, I've never been to Iceland. That's for like cool people on vacation. But one of those cool people like emailed me because he was in Iceland being a man of means. And he was like, oh, my friend wants me to send her a postcard. Like what gives? And I was like, I'll write you a postcard from Iceland. And so that was it. And I was imagining it'd be fun if you could fit it all, fit it all in one thing. Anyway, there you go. Haven't been, but I assume that's what it's like. I'm also a travel agent as well as a bartender and a tutor of six-year-olds. So yeah, what those people all have in common, the Icelandic and guys in a bar and six-year-olds is they're all drunk. So there's that, um, which is, that's a fact. That's a true scientific fact. Um, so yeah, we've all learned something. Um, okay, here's one. Another, another like poem I wrote that I wasn't, uh, I wasn't actually there for, but, um, but I wrote it anyway. Uh, it is called Telephone Lineman, 1964. Oh, which, this is kind of a depressing poem, but uh, I like, I, I Googled the title because I was like, I wonder if something else has ever had this title, like after I wrote it, I was like, ooh, let's go look. And um, apparently it's a uh, porno. It's like an old style, like, you know, your classic, like, man porno with the lineman, like, whatever. I mean, I didn't watch it, but I envisioned it based on the couple of stills that I saw. So it, it was like kind of like the village people, but you kick out everybody who, like, doesn't work on telephone poles. So, yeah, another, another fun fact. Okay, so Telephone Lineman, 1964. My friend and I went and walked on this really busy road to the candy store, which was dangerous and far, and somebody told on us, and we ran hiding from our parents, and I hid in the garage. And Billy, my friend, had a very tough father, and he was going to get whipped, but when my father found me, he just kind of took me aside and said, do you understand why it's really dangerous for you to do that at this point in your life. 
why it's really dangerous for a five-year-old to walk a mile along the highway to the candy store. And I felt really pleased at that point that he was my father. I had this dream when I was a kid. I fell out of a car on Hicksville Road and there was all this traffic and I was trying to get to the other side, but I couldn't walk. I was kind of just dragging myself and I had to get out the way of this car and I just leapt and I smashed my head against the wall where the bed was and woke myself up. Funny how you can look back at life or a dream you remembered. You can look and look, but nothing changes. Like some old film reanimated stays trapped within the frame. Still by still, the ghosts remain opaque. They do not know they will become a grandfather, move to California, stop breathing. They stand there in the garage, tenderly. Uncrowded by details like the future, the play of light and dark, a few metal hooks biting into splintered wood, the smell of gasoline. The scene is spare of everything but fear and tenderness. I see him looking down at this petrified child like a wild animal. I can see the whites of my eyes and being so gentle. Things were different at Billy's place. There was something about Billy, the tough luck tendril of his life, shooting off. And now he's dead. Did I tell you that? That people from my grade school could be dead amazes me. They were children. We held hands, especially with Paula, got sucker punched, kicked, dreamed in crayon, sat, waited in line, endlessly it seemed, though the lines led nowhere, and then recess. Yes, I got beaten up a lot, but not at home. Billy, I don't know how he died. Hadn't known him since we were 11 and he turned into an asshole when I moved. Perhaps he was beaten into it. I couldn't say. His father was a giant and a phone company lineman. He was tough with his boys and very careful with and protective of me. I felt he treated me like a girl for which I was grateful and also ashamed. I think he knew that I was not like his sons and that they picked on me. I don't know how he died either or how Billy felt about it. He did switch to Bill eventually when we were older and he was just an asshole I never really knew. Um, so that's that one. And, um, I don't know, should I read another one? No, probably not. That's like the end, right? No, you can read one more if we have time. Um, okay. I'll read this little, I'll read this little, little baby one. Um, it is called Teenage Stuff Forever. And, uh, and I really was there for this one. Hey, um, unlike Iceland in 1964, both of which are as far as I'm concerned, invented. Um, yeah, here's one, teenage stuff forever. You can continue doing this teenage stuff forever. You can sit on the road in the perfect summer dark and listen to a married man rail against the prison he has built for himself. It's the same street where you sat and smoked at 15 listening to a boy describe his father's rage, the bruises, the lonely why. They could be the same man, the man already jealous of his toddling son, the boy cowering from his father. It could be the same night, that June damp, the desire to touch the face of someone beautiful, with your rotten, perfect mouth.
and that's the end of that. Thank you so much, Ethan. <laughs> and you're gonna have to scroll a lot because people um, definitely reacted a lot to your reading. Thank you so much for sharing that work with us. It's gorgeous work. It's just absolutely beautiful. All right, everybody, please give a virtual round of applause and leave your reactions in the comments for, I'm, I keep saying her name wrong, Eva HD, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, and now we do have a little bit of time left. So this is going to be um, done in a very particular way. There's going to be a really brief um, audience Q&A. We do have time for it. So if you want to ask one or all of the poets a question, type your own name into the chat and I will call on you and you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, and I'm going to give everyone a couple of minutes to come up with a question if you would like. Um, in the meantime, I think, you know, all of these poets have books out and what they're doing is, you know, they're writing poetry and it really does make our lives better and more worth living. So I really encourage everybody to go to the Facebook page or look at the email you might have received from tribes or just Google it and buy these poets books and sit down and spend some time with their work. Um, because you know, you're going to feel better if you do, I promise. I feel like life is more worth living every time I sit down and spend just a couple hours with a book of poetry. So don't forget to do that. All right, so we're gonna look in the chat. Um, type your own name into the chat if anyone has um, a question as part of the Q&A for all or one of the poets. Any, uh, anyone at all, okay. Well, we're still, everyone's still applauding. The last person. All right, if not, um, I would just want to do a little talk back because I, I will ask a blanket question to all of the poets and we can go in order of your reading. I always like to know over the last year, um, is there anything that you have recently read and just pick one thing that you would um, very much in love and encourage other people to read and um, yeah, just tell us a little bit about that and what it meant to you. Something that you've read recently that you've just discovered that we should know about. And we will start with Benga, if he's still on. Yeah, I'm here, thank you. Um, again, thank you for having me. This was such a beautiful reading. It's just so good, thank you for having me. I recently read a book by Marlon James called The Book of Night Women. Uh, so Marlon James is, famous, you know, kind of ways writers can get famous for A Brief History of Seven Killings. Uh, it's a book about the attempted assassination of Bob Marley. Uh, it's just a great book. It's just a wonderful book. But he has an older book called The Book of Night Women that I never read before. I picked, I think I read it in two days and it's a, it's a relatively large tome. The voice is unbelievable. It stays inside you. His, his powers are just so great. So that book has stayed with me, uh, the book of Night Women. Um, I think people should absolutely check that out. It's, on, it's, it's just so powerful. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I have um, read part of that so far and been recommended it by a few other friends. It's an amazing book. Definitely check it out. And yes, thank you so much. Um, I just want to say everyone's names again. Um, Gabinga Adishino, Wanda Phipps, C.A. Conrad, and Eva HD, thank you guys so much for this reading. It's been absolutely gorgeous. Also want to shout out um, one of Tribe's editors is here, Danny Schott. We got a couple of Tribe's board members here, Hilary Maslin and Catherine Arnaldi both joined, um, both amazing artists and writers. Then everyone, please give a big virtual round of applause to Tracy Williams, who's been making sure that the technical aspects of this thing run like the whole time as she does every single reading. Tracy, and Tracy is also a brilliant photographer. Hello. We've got all the, everyone here is like an artist in like a five different ways at least, which is what I love about our gathering of the tribes. Awesome. All right, um, the next one, CA, do you have anything to recommend to us that maybe I should pick up and read? Yes, there's this, I'm going to put this in the chat. It's the Collected Complete Poems of Ilyasa Seguin. Back in 1995, she and I were doing a reading together in um, 
London for this anthology, Mad Cow Poets. And um, I've never been at a reading like this since where she wouldn't read. Like she would, she was supposed to get up and read and then she would just giggle and say, oh no, no, I'm not gonna do it. And then she would never get up and read. <laughs> she just wouldn't do it. And they like flew her there to do all this. But anyway, um, she passed away a number of years ago and I'm so excited that this book is out. It's just gorgeous. It's fantastic. That's the book. Oh my God, that's amazing. And I have a very special gift here that I needed to show everybody. You might recognize this. You might recognize this. This is something I got sent in the mail with an amazing and um, private note. So I'm not gonna share the note with everybody, but this is um, CA's new chat book. I can't see myself. Can everybody see this? I literally, oh yeah, good. Okay, there it is. CA's new chat book. So I get to sit here and look at the shapes and even like touch them all day long. So where can people get this chat book, CA, if they want it? There were just, there aren't any, yeah. <laughs> it's just me. Well, okay, so I just showed off and made everyone jealous and uh, never mind. Now I feel like an asshole, but ooh, look what I got. You can't have it. <laughs> Right. No, you got to put it in the mail with like an extra treat and mail it to the next person. And then they add like a little chocolate. Oh, that, yeah. <laughs> I think I might. Yeah, that could be good. But I will probably just keep it like, like the asshole I am. I love collecting books. <sighs> awesome. Oh, who's next? Let's see. Oh, Wanda. Wanda, any recommendations for reading? Yes, I read, let's see, a book I really loved was uh, uh, A Place in the Sun. I have it here, it's by Lewis Warsh. It's not new, it's out by Spite and Divo, but it's, um, it's a collection of interconnected um, stories. And it's, it's fiction, it's just amazing. I don't know how to describe it, but I loved it so much. And, um, and also I feel uh, so sad that we lost Lewis. Um, recently like that he died recently but um his book is amazing so everybody should read it it's a part of it is um part of it is uh based on uh, a place in the sun the the movie with elizabeth taylor and montgomery cliff and um and which was also based on the novel the dreiser novel american tragedy and it's it's it, this amazing kind of collage of of like rumor and gossip and imagination about um, their imagined lives and what actually happened to both of them while they were um, during their careers and um, their relationship together, their friendship. Um, and then the other stories or these characters that are kind of connected to that story as well, but um, sort of shoot off from it. It's just really beautiful prose. So. Can I see it again? Can you oh. show the cover? I don't know if you can, wait, I don't know. Oh yeah, I can see that. Oh, I can't and it's short fiction that's sort of connected? Yes, they're like interconnected stories. Thank you so much. A Place in the Sun, all right, very cool. Thank you so much. And then you, um, Eva, I have to like reprogram my brain because I've been saying your name differently in my head this whole time. Eva H. But do you remember, you remember that outcast song, like I'm sorry, Ms. Jackson? Yeah. There's a part in it where he's like, forever, forever, ever. <laughs> Tis I. That song is actually about me, not Miss Jackson. She's just a smoke screen. Uh, yeah. So now That's you can. Very helpful. Yeah. How could I forget after that? Good. Well, there you go. And also, who cares? It's just a name. You, know? you could say whatever you want. Um, for books that I'm reading, uh, I try to think of something that's not like too dry, but I can't, I'm a real bore. <laughs> but you know what, I was reading, I went on this like Gore Vidal binge where I just kept like gobbling up and I was like, I'm only gonna, this guy's such he's a dick. Like, I'm only gonna... Is that a new person or? He's newly dead in 2012. But... I don't know if anyone's heard of him. Gore Vidal, he was like, at one time he was, Thank he's you. like, he fucked Jack Kerouac one time. Jack Kerouac was like, it. I'm not gay. <laughs> no way. Gore Vidal was like, you are now. It's so crazy. I read his memoir. I was like, what? This is have not you, how you treat people. Have you seen but him, I, um, like, hand Norman Mailer his own asshole? Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, always. He's always doing that. So I went on this thing, but then I'm like, I'd read one of his books and decide three quarters of the way through that the book was too long. And I was like, I'm not doing this to myself again. And then when I'd end it, I'd like take another one out of the library. So I did that a bunch. And then as soon as I finally was like, okay, I read like five of these door stoppers about like the Roman Empire. I'm not going to do it anymore. I was walking through the park and I was like assaulted by a little free library. This door is just swinging open with a Gorman All book in it. And I was like, what? How dare you? But in it, I just cracked it open to a random page. I was like, I'm just going to read a random page instead of taking this book away. And I got the page where like this interviewer asked him some really like fatuous, ignorant question. And he's like, but Americans don't like women. They never have. And it made me so happy. So I guess just like reading, <laughs> reading Gore Vidal in general. Oh, but you know what else? Here's a poetry thing. This guy, John Murillo, who wrote a book, it's called Contemporary Poetry in America, but the C's are K's. He's really okay. fucking good. He wrote a, there's a poem he wrote called Crips, Bloods and Butterfly. No, that's the first line. It's called Mercy, Mercy Me, like the, like the song. And the open you can read all of Gore Vidal's like yeah. So if you if you get in this position where you've been That's reading correct. too much Gore Vidal, you can read this guy John Murillo who writes like a angel, and then um, there you go. That's my contribution to this. Thank you so much. I'm gonna stick with you for one sec, um, and then go in a different order. Someone's asking you a specific question. It's Catherine Arnaldi. Um, Catherine, can you just talk? I just want you you know. Why don't you just come on here and ask your question to Eva? Well, uh, I don't know. Um, it was maybe three poems back, not the uh, that she read, and there was a really fast line about the mother, and I just, it, I thought it was so beautiful, and I would just love to have it repeated if possible. Oh, with the skin, the like scalded um, milk. Yes, the scalded the person milk. In Iceland. Yeah, what was that? Let me. I go find it uh she was like oh because she was singing a lullaby right it was i've been thinking of the irish rain moistening the skin on the scalded milk of my mother's voice was that it here you know what i'll just put it in the friggin chat and then you can booyah wonderful and I then you can have it forever of our seats wanting to hear that again i know i was Catherine definitely was beautiful that's basically everybody um okay how do i so, send? how do you not send a message oh here i got it you can send it to everybody <laughs> here you go there's there's the milk i'll mute my now we have a question to all of the poets so i'm going to start the rotation all over again and this will probably be the last last question of the night and it's a technical question from david french um, David, do you want me to read it? I see you're on chat here. Do you want to ask it yourself? Okay, I'm going to uh, Sure. Oh, there you are. You uh, I could ask it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, first of all, thank you to everybody for your, for your poems and your recitations. I was just wondering for, for, for the poets who, who recited, um, do you, when you, whether you're reading your own poem or reading someone else's poem, learning some, learning becoming familiar with other people's poetry. Do you read a poem in your head at the same speed that you recite it? Um, does that change depending on your mood or, or your relationship to the poem over time? Um, I realized from listening at, uh, I realized from listening to Eva HD that I read her poems too quickly to myself, I think, maybe. That's kind of why I thought of the question. So I was wondering what you guys thought about that idea. Can we go in order again? Can we start with Binga? Be here. Oh, oh sure, sure. sure. Um, I mean, so so the way you, I mean, in my experience, the way I read each poem is a different interpretation of the poem. It's a different engagement with the poem. It's a different entrance into the poem. And it sometimes depends on the kind of entrance I'm allowed into the poem. 
So for instance, some of the, the, all the poems I read today, this is like 2017, 18 poems. And it's difficult to go back there because I'm no longer that poet. Um, and sometimes the poem resists me and does not allow me to come in fully. And sometimes the poem take me in and say something new to me. Uh, like I have what I want to do in my head now, just because I read these poems. I, I, there's something I'm going to do when we're done with this meeting. There's something I need to do, just because I was reading those poems to people. Um, so the, the relationship is always different. It's, it's a psychic space. It's an electric space. Reading it is like entering them. Um, what I do know is that my friends who read poems read the poems differently. Uh, because the poem is their world now, when they're reading it, it's no longer my world, it's theirs now. And they're gonna read it according to their own velocity, according to their own tempo, according to their own temperament. And yeah, you just, you know, it's like entering a house. You go in through all kinds of doors, uh, depending on what, what you are allowed at the time. Um, that's my experience, thank you. CA, you wanna hop on here? Did you get the question? I can also- Yeah, it. oh no, I heard it. Thank you. Well, I don't, I'm, I'm more, the speed of the writing is not something that I'm so interested in. Although, I mean, that comes up, of course. All I can tell you is that um, I trained my voice many years ago to, I first found the range that I have. And then after finding the range, I would score each poem with my own sort of handmade shorthand on um, where things should go with my range. And then I just allow it to, I just practice it until I can read it where it sounds like it's ready. You know, shape is sound and sound is shape. So the shapes of the poems are a part of that inflection. Thank you. Thanks. Wanda, you can hop on in. Oh. Okay, um, I'm trying to think. Well, like like uh, CA, I um, I tend to mark up the poems uh, for reading, like a script, and um, so I'll mark it up in a certain way for emphasis and for pauses. But then when I actually start to read it, whatever the energy is, just kind of takes over. So it's always different. Um, and I also, also sometimes leave myself notes to slow down because I tend to go faster and faster because the energy is like going um, inside of me. And so, but I think like when you, someone else is reading my poetry, um, that it is true that it's, it's all, also theirs then when they're reading it. So it's their interpretation and they bring their experiences to it. So, you know, it's all their own thing. It's colored by, you know, whatever they want to bring to it. So um, speed is a variable thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you welcome the other interpretations. Yes, definitely, yeah. definitely. It's amazing to hear other people read your work. Um, I've had the opportunity to hear like actors read my work and it's, it's amazing what they can do with them. Um, that's very different than, you know, the person who wrote it. I mean, it's, it's personal to the person who wrote it, but to an actor, it becomes personal to them because they bring their own experiences and their own associations and also their skill as actors, which is totally yeah. different. Thanks. Thanks. So then um, Eva, you can also jump in here. Um, I don't normally read my, my poetry, I guess. I like reading other people, so that's good. Uh, and I have, yeah, I don't know the answer to this question. Do you usually read other people's out loud? Yeah, sometimes, because otherwise I might read it, you know, too quick, or I'll skip, like, skip ahead to see what happens. Like, it's, you know, <laughs> some sort of, like, myth. but then I'm like, no, wait, this is supposed to be fun. So then I'm, I like to read someone else's poem out loud, and then all its deliciousness comes up, you know, it's like the word sort of climb they repel up the sides of your throat, you know, and say hello or whatever. Like, it's just very nice. You can you read it out loud just you know. to yourself, you mean, not like at readings. Are you trying to say that I'm a lunatic? Because it's true. I, I am. I sit alone in this like 
weird house that I'm house sitting and read poetry aloud to myself. And then I'm like, it's COVID. Everybody else is crazy now too. That's I think that answers the question. Actually. Yeah. Awesome. Anything else? No. Nope. All right. Okay, everybody, this has been amazing. And I just want to thank all four of the poets. You've actually made me feel really like happy with my life. I feel like I'm in the right place at the right time if you all um, agreed to join me. And I cannot thank you enough for coming and sharing your amazing work. Thank you, Benga. Thank you, CA. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you, Eva. Mwah. Thank you, Poetry. And um, please, everybody, check out a gathering of the tribes um, over and out. Hi, everybody. That was wonderful. <laughs>